Good evening and welcome everyone to our faith enrichment class. We are uh, in our eighth week and we're talking about the divine economy of Jesus Christ and just say a recap from last week and the week before the objective of divine economy of the whole work of the divine economy accomplished by Christ with the goodwill of the Father and the synergy of the Holy Spirit was and is to release man from the tyranny of the devil and sin to make him a bearer of the spirit and to restore him to the first created beauty of the heavenly kingdom saint basil says the divine economy is the raising up of man from his fallen state and his return to kinship with god from the alienation caused by his disobedience so the divine economy manifests God's condescension from the divine heights of um, the divine heights to the lowliness of man and as we spoke last time its main events is the incarnation of Christ uh, at Annunciation their fearful passion the crucifixion his resurrection his ascension and the descent of the paraclete the Holy Spirit I mentioned last time a lot of these are oh, all of these are feasts of the church we celebrate them commemorate them throughout the year every year but it's not just a recognition of historic events like Christmas we just celebrate because it's his birthday uh, but it's part of the work that Jesus Christ enters into to restore humanity back to God and so we, we celebrate that reality more than just a historic event. <clears throat> the mystery of the divine incarnation opened the way for man's salvation and deification, becoming like God. However, we cannot speak of this mystery without glorifying the bridal chamber where this mystical marriage of God to human nature was accomplished. And this is the most holy Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, the All-Holy Mother of God in the Divine Economy. So the principal name of the Mother of Christ, right, the Virgin Mary, is the Most Holy Theotokos. It becomes a, a, a dogmatic statement to call her the Mother of God. Since Christ is the God-man, his mother who gave birth to him is called the birth giver of God. And so we we clearly state that in the in the Greek word theotokos and tokos is to give birth or to bear and theos is God so she is the God bearer in one of the ecumenical councils was it the second ecumenical council they argued over calling her theotokos versus um, Christotokos they wanted to say let's call her the Christ bearer because that was a less offensive to some people's ears to say the God bearer, because obviously God the Father does not have a mother. And so to not offend, they said, let's call it the Christotokos, the Christ bearer. But the church in her wisdom says, bless you, says to call her, uh, call her Christotokos would, it would undermine the statement that she is the God bearer. Jesus Christ is not just the Son of God, but He is God. And to say that Mary only bore the Christ as if to split hairs and say, you know, we don't want to say He's God, would undermine the theology that Christ is also God, the second person of the Trinity. And so the church in its ecumenical council declared it as a dogma of the church. Uh, interestingly, there's lots of canons and rules of the church, but I would say they don't make dogmatic statements out of everything, only as it relates to our salvation. So the ever Virgin Mary, we call her Theotokos because she's the God bearer. How does that relate to our salvation? If she's just a woman who bore a child who became God, that changes the whole Christology, our whole understanding of who Jesus Christ is. If she's just a Christotokos, and it's almost intentional not to say Theotokos, it would be as to say that the Christ is not God. 
And if Christ is not God, if if Jesus becomes God at some other time, um, the whole theology around our salvation is undermined and falls apart. Because unless he is the full God, full man, uh, we, we won't find salvation through him. And so as a dogmatic statement, she is the Theotokos, the God bearer. A non-dogmatic statement, uh, I would say, regarding the Theotokos, is the Dormition of Mary, where we celebrate August 14th, that she falls asleep in the Lord, and uh, her soul is received uh, by Christ, and then her body is received by Christ. Um, it's not a dogmatic statement, whether she was resurrected from the tomb on the third day, uh, but it becomes tradition of the church, and we teach it as a uh, an extension of the teaching of the resurrection, that our resurrection will also be bodily like Christ's resurrection and much like the Theotokos. But it's not a dogmatic statement. So if people say, well, Father, I'm not sure I, I really believe that whole story, I'd say that's all right. It's, it's not dogma. It's not... Um, your your membership of the orthodox church is not contingent on this belief however if you refuse to say theotokos uh we even sang that tonight speechless be uh speechless be the tongues of uh the impious ones who refuse her refuse to call her the theotokos um we would say well that's part of the dogma of the church recognizing her as the mother of god so that was a lot. Hmm. So the Most Holy Theotokos, an awareness of the magnificence of the Mother of God and the gratitude due to the, bene the, the benefactress of all creation prompt every believer to offer her a crown of praise with a trembling hand and a yearning soul, says St. Simeon, the new theologian. There are many names we use when singing praises to the All Holy Virgin, but Theotokos is her primary and dogmatic title, the birth giver of God. Panagia is one of my favorite. It's it's more of a, a term of endearment, but it's the O Holy, you know, the O Holy Theotokos, Panagia. Uh, this name expresses the entire mystery of the divine economy, the God bearer. If she who gave birth is the Theotokos, then he who was born of her is unquestionably God, and certainly he is also man. Something I often show in relation to the icon almost all the icons of the theotokos has christ in her arms unless she's uh, unless he's on her lap or in her in her womb and i say the icon of the theotokos is as much about her as it is about jesus christ because we recognize that christ um is born of a woman all things born of women, of human women, are human, right? They don't have anything else other than human child, human children. And to say that Jesus Christ is truly born of her, obviously he's a human. But the her we're speaking of, we call the God bearer. So not only is he human, but she bears God in the flesh. So for how can the pre-eternal God be born of a woman unless he had become a man? In the naming the Virgin Theotokos, we are proclaiming the mystery of the incarnation of God, the word in accordance with the Orthodox faith. Just as the Most Holy Theotokos became mother according to the flesh of the incarnate God, so she becomes by grace mother of all Christians who are deified through her. That is why every Christian with filial um, uh, gratitude, a uh, loving gratitude, praises the one who made God the son of man and men the son of God. Sorry. <laughs> praises the one who made God the son of man and, the, and men the sons of God. Singular. <laughs> so... We have become partakers in the divine nature through you, Eva Virgin, for you are, for you gave birth to God incarnate for our sake. And so, as is fitting, we all devoutly magnify you, St. Gregory Palamas. The debt of the human race to the mother, uh, the most holy mother of God, will never be fully repaid because her gifts are continuous and inexhaustible. 
her son, Christ. Just as the Son of God assumed our nature through his mother, so we receive deification from him through her. Therefore, according to the God-bearing fathers, the Most Holy Theotokos alone is the boundary between created and uncreated nature. No one can draw near to God except through her and the intercessor born of her. And none of the God's gifts can be given to angels or men except through her. She was that that connection between earth and heaven. And so I've seen a, a clever bumper sticker. No Mary, no Jesus. And if you know Mary, you'll know Jesus. By her ministry in the divine economy, the Lady Theotokos became the benefactress of all creation. Heaven and earth, humans and angels have received the blessing of the mother of God. The Virgin made it possible for the angels to become wiser and purer than before to know God's goodness and wisdom better. So in this way, the Virgin created a new heaven and a new earth, or rather she is herself the new earth and the new heaven, says St. Nicholas Cavasilius. As the, in, as the incarnation of God, the word was the divine purpose for which all things came into being. So the most holy Theotokos, the agent of this mystery, was the purpose of which the entire intelligible and sensible world was created. The Lady Theotokos is the foundation on which the prophets base their teachings and the starting point of the apostles, the support of the martyrs, and the bedrock of teachers. So she is the glory of humans on earth, the delight of angels in heaven, the adornment of all creation. By her submission to the counsel of God, the ever virgin was counted worthy to become the nurturer of her creator. And her son, repaying that debt, um, gave her grace to become the nurturer of every spiritual and rational nature of angels and men. For he made her worthy of providing for them in abundance as their food and their heavenly delight, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, says St. Gregory Palamas. So we have the nativity. Uh, in preparation for the mystery of his incarnation, Christ chose the holiest from each generation of his ancestors according to the flesh until he came to Joachim and Anna, the righteous forebearers of God. They enshrined the holiness of all the ancestors and correspondingly, he was well pleased that his mother, according to the flesh, should be born of them. The, hymno the hymnology of the church also refers to this. You who enjoyed a most exalted life of splendor Together you surpass all the parents of the earth, for you have you have birth to the virgin for you have birth to the pure virgin, and through her became truly the forebearers of God. And this is of the canon on September 9th uh, for the uh, nativity of of Mary. Having been childless for many years, the holy forebearers of God turned to the Almighty in deep pain and sorrow, the forebearers being Joachim and Anna. They were made worthy to give birth to the All-Holy Virgin, who would bring forth according to the flesh the Son of God. In most iconography of Joachim and Anna, they are in an embrace. They're, they're touching each other. They're sometimes holding each other. Um, this is to emphasize and signify the natural conjugal union of them to conceive Mary, uh, as opposed to the Western tradition of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, where she is born uh, without interaction between her parents. So um, we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. Those without children were preferred to those with many, so that the all-virtuous daughter might be born of the most virtuous, the all-chaste of the most chaste, St. Gregory Palamas. So the Virgin Mother was born of a barren woman. The coming of that which is alone is new under the sun. The culmination of miracles had to be prepared by the means of miracles. St. John Damascus celebrates the feast in the following words. Today the gates of sterility are open and a divine and virginal gate appears from and through which God will enter into the world. The centuries 
compete with each other over which will have the pride of her birth. The joy brought by the birth of Theotokos extends to extends over the whole of creation. Your birth, O Theotokos, has brought joy to all the inhabited earth, according to her feast day. So the conception of the Most Holy Theotokos was pure and holy without blemish, but it was not immaculate as Roman Catholics describe it. Growing up, I always thought the Immaculate Conception was the theology based on Christ, although it's that's, that is a true statement, but that is not the the teaching necessarily within the Catholic Church. I learned later that it was the Immaculate Conception of Mary that she was conceived through interaction with the Holy Spirit. The Romans maintained that the All Holy Virgin Mary was born free of the original sin, and the heretical doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of the Theotokos distorts the teaching of Holy Scripture about original sin, for it separates the All Holy Virgin from her holy ancestors and denies the unity of the human race. She becomes unlike us. God's intervention released Anna, the foremother of God, from her sterility, but it did not supplant the work of nature, uh, the, the work of Joachim. The belief of the, or, the Orthodox Church is that original sin is transmitted to all humans, even Our Lady Theotokos. So the All Holy Virgin, although free of any personal sin, was also born bearing original sin from which the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit cleansed her and made her holy on the day of the Annunciation on which we celebrate in, in March. This month. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. And so the Roman Catholic teaching of original sin is distorted as well from how the Orthodox understand it. We inherit the sin of Adam, but what that means is we bear the consequences of sin, and that is death. Um, we're not guilty for Adam's sin. And therefore, Mary is born, just like the rest of us, bearing the, the marks of Adam's sin, but not, not the guilt of Adam's sin. And so none of us are born with the guilt of Adam's sin. I joke and say, I got enough of my own. I don't need Adam's sin, let alone anyone else's. So the entry into the temple, the presentation of Mary, November 21st. After the Virgin Mary was born and had been weaned, Joachim and Anna, the holy forebearers of God, hastened to fulfill their promise to dedicate her to God. So it was that when the Holy Mary reached the age of three, they brought her to the temple of God in Jerusalem and committed her into the hands of the high priests, and then led her led her into a holy led her into the holy of holies, where she remained for twelve years. Father Nick, where do you get this? How do we know this? It's not in the Bible. Well, this comes from holy tradition and what we call the Proto-Evangelion of James, the first gospel of James. Uh, this book belongs to the so-called apocryphal books, uh, gospels, but the church considers some parts of it to be historically accurate. Among them, the part included the Synexarion of the Feast of the Entry of the Most Holy Mother of God into the Temple. So through tradition, oral tradition, and from some of these extra-biblical books, we understand that Mary was brought to the temple at the age of three and was there for about 12 years until the noble Joseph becomes her um, betrothed. And we can understand it more as, as a guardian for her. It's not canonical, uh, the Proto-Evangelion. It's not canonical like the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But it is of value to our tradition and additionally, uh, part of it is also uh, included in the Quran. Did you know that? Part of the Proto Gospel of James. You're shaking your head like you knew that. Did you know that? <laughs> yes, I think so. That's awesome. <clears throat> I didn't know that until I. I didn't know that until I prepared this. My mom talked about it. Oh yeah. So she who is eternally the holy of holies. Enter the temporal holy of holies, St. Gregory Palamas. Even at the tender age that Theotokos understood what was happening to her, so indicating that rather than 
being led by others to the Holy of Holies, she came to God by herself voluntarily of her own free will. It was as though it were natural for her to fly towards him out of holy and divine love and the belief that entering and dwelling in the Holy of Holies was something desirable and in the knowledge that it was fitting to her. According to Jewish practice, the high priest alone was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies once a year, but was persuaded by divine revelation to allow the O Holy Virgin to also enter into the Holy of Holies, which was prefigured, uh, which was a prefiguration of herself. The Holy of Holies is a prefigurement of the Theotokos. So St. Gregory writes, she who is eternally the Holy of Holies entered the temporal Holy of Holy. St. Gregory has revealed to us through divine enlightenment the wonderful life that the Theotokos lived while there. Her work was the unceasing contemplation of God. Ministered to by angels, her life was that of an angel. She opened through her pure and unceasing prayers a new path to heaven, which St. Gregory calls the silence of the intellect. Her whole existence was dedicated to God through her all holy way of life. So not merely coming to resemble God, but she also made God in the likeness of men. So in accordance, so we're made in the likeness of God. So she's not only in the likeness of God, she made it possible for men to be made in the, uh, for God to be made in the likeness of men. In accordance with the plan of divine providence, when the All Holy Virgin reached the age 15, the wise Joseph received from Zacharias the Virgin into his protection and care to serve the great mystery of Christ's incarnation, which was to be accomplished through her. The annunciation by the Archangel Gabriel that she should give birth to the Son of God followed, up, followed upon Joseph, taking the Virgin in his care. This we spoke about uh, last week. And, and to, to refresh with Joseph, you know, people like to say, um, well, in the scripture, we hear about Jesus's brothers and sisters. And I just have a hard time processing the Archangel Gabriel telling you the girl, the woman that you are betrothed to will bear the savior of the world. The child she bears is the child of God. And then you put, put on some music and think, let's get it on. Right? You can't do that to the Theotokos. Like, God chose her. You don't look at her the same way. I don't think. Like, if he told me my wife will bear a child of God and he will save all of us of our sin, I think that changes our relationship. <laughs> She's now the mother of my God, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I just have a hard time thinking that they had conjugal relationships and bore other children. But there are Old Testament prophecies. Uh, I like the one in Ezekiel of the East Gate that the, the prince will come through that no other shall enter. Uh, the gate is a prefigurement of Mary and the prince, of course, is Christ that no other shall pass through. The Dormition of the Theotokos, the Fallen Asleep of the Virgin Mary, uh, this is the next event that we talk about within the feast days of Mary. After the resurrection of her son, the Theotokos was the first made worthy to behold it, remain for the rest of her life about 10 years in the house of the beloved disciple John, as was commanded by Christ at the cross. At the Dormition, the apostles were miraculously gathered from various parts of the world to magnify her God-receiving body the boast of all creation. Her son himself was also invisibly present and paid homage befitting to his mother. And in the icon of, of the Dormition, so we show the disciples here and we have Christ um, dressed in this gold. It's his, part of his resurrection uh, for us to understand. And she's, he's carrying the infant soul uh, of Mary that he receives into the kingdom. And then he's surrounded by the heavenly hosts. So he receives into his own hands her holy soul, 
now separated from the tabernacle that received God. And he rightly honors her who was by nature as a human being, his handmaid, but whom he made to be his mother out of the unfathomable ocean of his divine love for mankind, St. John Damascus. The most holy mother of God is the queen of heaven. That is why in heaven, her all holy dormition was celebrated. Um, that is why in heaven, her all holy dormition was a celebration presided over by Christ himself. St. John uh, of Damascus continues to write, Come down, O Lord, come down to repay to your mother, to whom you are so indebted, all that you owe her by having nurtured you. Can you see why there is such adoration for the Virgin Mary, the chosen one of God to take flesh and be born of? We are born in an image of God, and he, through the Theotokos, is born in the image of man. She nurtured and raised Jesus and was there all the way to the end with a motherly concern and love for her child at the presentation of Christ to the temple to the crucifixion. She's there. So with the presentation of Christ at the temple, the child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a soul and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Uh, from the Gospel of John. The presentation so intimately entwines to Christ's crucifixion and there's no other connection to his crucifixion than, than this reading here, linking the mother to it. So through death, the source of life is carried over into true life, and it's a truly paradoxical thing. So in this reading from St. John, she is so intimately connected to Christ and his crucifixion. Um, he says, a, soul, a sword will pierce your own soul at the sight of of her son being crucified. The Dormition of the Theotokos is her transition into the heavenly and immortal life, and therefore its commemoration is the occasion for a joyful feast and celebration for the entire world. As the saints addressing themselves, the Theotokos affirm, what shall we call this mystery concerning you, death? But even though of physical necessity, your all holy and all blessed soul was separated from your blessed and immaculate body and your body was committed to burial as deemed as demanded by custom. It did not remain in death, nor was it dissolved into corruption for she whose virginity remained intact when she gave birth to Christ kept also her body indissoluble in her passage to the other life and was translated to a higher and more divine tabernacle which is not cut down by death, but remains eternally. From St. John Damascus. All things in your life were extraordinary, desired and sweeter than honey and the honeycomb from Psalms. That is why we, your servants, desire those things, and in desiring them, we are greatly rewarded by you, St. Eremenos. The Lady Mother of God is the bond linking heaven and earth. She united man with God. From Christ, the head of the body, which is the church, comes every perfect gift, according to the book of James. And through the Mother of God, who is the neck of the body, the divine gift reaches the faithful, the members of the body. The Mother of Jesus, who directed, uh, the Mother of Jesus, who directly bears the head, which is Christ, is a mediator between the head of the church and the body, and in a way link joining the two like a neck. In consequence, just as the head Christ is the only way that leads to the Father, so this sacred neck, the mother of God, is also a way, the only way that leads everyone to the head of, head of all, which is Christ. The power of the mother of God is prayer is invincible. The power of the mother of God's prayer is invincible. Every sinner calls on the all merciful mother of Christ and through her finds salvation. I have you as a mediatress with God, the lover of mankind. I supplicate you, O Virgin, come unto my aid most quickly. And we sang a translation of that in tonight's Paracasis. So in the Old Testament, there's prefigurements of Mary. Just as Jesus is prophesied and prefigured, 
Here are some examples of the prefigurement of Mary from the Old Testament. King David, I opened my mouth and pray the spirit filled it like David said, to pour out a good word to the mother and queen. I will celebrate her feast with joy and gladness and sing to her merrily lauding her miracles. We sing that uh, during the Akathis that we'll do Friday, next Friday. And as we consider David, David arose and went to Judah to fetch the ark. Mary rising up and went to Judah. She is the ark. David is overcome with joyful shouting when he comes to the ark. Elizabeth cried out with a loud voice when Mary came to her. David is leaping and dancing. John the Baptist leaped in the womb when Christ came to her bearing, when the Theotokos came to Elizabeth bearing the Christ. And David asks, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? And Elizabeth asks, and whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So we see this back and forth. Haha, <laughs> the Ark of the Covenant. That's from Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I knew I did that. <laughs> like there's a cool picture. The Ark of the Covenant, just as the Ark of the Covenant held the Ten Commandments, the Word of God, so also Mary bore the Word of God incarnate. Also within the ark is the manna, the bread from heaven, and Christ being the true bread from heaven and the bread of life. In the ark was the rod of Aaron that identified Moses' brother Aaron as the next leader of the Jews, their high priest. And Christ is our high priest, the priesthood of Aaron. Noah's ark, the ark survived the floods of sin and the flood of destruction and defilement and delivered Noah into the new world and the salvation of mankind through him. Mary too, left without sin, undefiled, ever a virgin, delivers Christ into the world. Jacob's ladder, as the angel of the Lord, who was the second person of the Trinity, descends down the ladder to wrestle with Jacob, who he is now named Israel, uh, he who wrestles with God. Mary is the ladder by which we ascend to God, and she is also the ladder through whom the glory of God descended from heaven to earth and was incarnate as Jesus Christ. She is the sacred space for which God the man, and man mingled. The sacred space for which God and man mingled. And then the burning bush. The great mystery of your childbirth did Moses perceive within the burning bush. The youth vividly prefigured this, standing in the midst of the fire and remaining unconsumed. O undefiled and holy virgin, we praise you and therefore in hymns to the ages. Moreover, the burning bush is also a, pref uh, a prefigurement for both the manner in which Mary gave birth as a virgin and carried the divine while remaining human. The bush that was unconsumed by the, the fire of the Holy Spirit. So the Trinity is, is evident. The Father speaks. The Father speaks to Moses. The Lord is the angel of the Lord among the fire. And the fire is the Holy Spirit. Mary is the unconsumed bush. Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary facing, facing east, but it was closed. The Lord said to me, the gate must remain closed. It must not be open and no one should come through it because the Lord, the God of Israel, came through it and it must remain closed, Ezekiel. And in the icon of Ezekiel, it says, I saw you, O Theotokos, as a closed gate through which God alone was entered. This door is the intact virginity of Mary, which before, during, and after divine childbirth, which in the icons of Mary, she has the, the stars on her, um, has always kept intact the virginal seal as the door sealed to remain always closed. All the more so because, as St. Ambrose says, Christ has passed through it but not opened it. There is a certain irony at work here. Mary is the ladder, one might also say the portal or opening between heaven and earth. Yet she is also closed off in a certain sense. She is the pure accessibility while remaining entirely untouched. In her, then, we see a figure for the incarnation itself in which God came to us while remaining unseen in his essence. So, 
So the role Mary plays in the divine economy, you know, it gets minimized in, in I think, Protestant theology. Uh, it gets watered down and, and she is relegated to just being a woman of hardly mentioning by name. But as we saw through this presentation, she's not just a woman who bore a child because that child is God. And she is a chosen one to bear that child. Someone says to me, God could have chose anyone, right? And it is true. But he didn't choose you. <laughs> he didn't choose me. He chose her. And so when people ask, you know, why do you worship Mary? We first clarify, we don't worship Mary. We do uh, glorify her because God glorified her. We do honor her because God honored her. And then if God chose her first, why should we reject her? Like God chose her. <laughs> so uh, that is her role, among other things, within our divine economy. That's the end of our, our lesson for today. Next week, uh, we'll do um, Lenten services. Next week, Monday is Clean Monday, so we begin Lent. We're going to do the Great Compline, uh, Andrew Crete. Uh, throughout, we'll have Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday, we'll have Liturgy of Pre-Sanctified Gifts. Thursday, the completion of the Compline, uh, of the Canon of Andrew. And then Friday, we'll do the Akathis of the Theotokos. In the hymns of the Akathis of the Theotokos, uh, much of the hymns we reference in tonight's lesson uh, are... Uh, all in the hymns of the Akathis of the Theotokos. It, it's quite beautiful. Those hymns essentially teach this lesson of her role in our salvation. So thank you all for joining us tonight. As I mentioned at the start of this, we won't have class next week, and we'll figure out what we're going to do throughout Lent. Uh, there's there's a saying at the end of Pascha, Christ is risen but the priest is dead because Holy Week is so intense and Lent can be so intense. And um, I'm going to keep an eye on that to not overdo it. So thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time. I'll send a, an announcement out for the next class.